Hi, I'm Michelle Segrist, and welcome to the Factory of the Future podcast. This podcast is inspired by my three-volume book series on the evolution of modern manufacturing. Each episode features engaging conversations with game-changing experts discussing the processes and innovations that are changing the landscape of modern manufacturing. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and leave me a five-star rating on iTunes and take just a couple of seconds to leave a review. And then go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss a single episode. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Jason Boyovich. He's a fractional CMO, a researcher, and he's the author of a new book. It's called Marketer in Chief, How Each President Sold the American Idea. It's very, very interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Jason. In a career that spans more than 25 years... Jason has launched hundreds of new products. He's launched everything from medical devices to virtual healthcare systems to non-dairy consumer cheese to next generation alternatives to the dreaded cone of shame for pets. He's even marketed sex aids for cows. Really interesting stuff. He's a graduate of both the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota, and he's completed postgraduate studies at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His formal training has been invaluable, but he credits his true success to growing up in a family of artists, immigrants, and entrepreneurs. They taught him how to carefully observe the world, how to see patterns before others notice them, and to use those insights to create new innovations. History is Jason's favorite way to observe the world. He believes that people from the past have plenty to teach us about the challenges and opportunities that we face today. Now, as I mentioned, Jason recently wrote this book, Marketer-in-Chief, How Each President Sold the American Idea. It's a book charting the evolution of the United States through the eyes of its chief salesperson. So you're probably wondering what marketing and this book about presidents has to do with factories and manufacturing and infrastructure. Well, several of the stories in the book touch on branding and messaging, but one in particular really stands out. And it's all about Warren Harding and the Pershing map. Before there was an interstate highway system, the manufacturing community needed decent roads to get goods to market and more to the point for General Pershing for war readiness. So today we're going to talk about this idea of creating a Pershing map for the future of manufacturing and see if we can discover what that would look like. I cannot wait to have this conversation because I think it's really going to be unique and interesting. So let's get right to it. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a really, it's, it's a huge pleasure to be here. And I love talking about history, of course. But when you think about marketing more broadly than just promotion and advertising and all the things people see, it's often what you don't see that's so important. And that's why infrastructure is so critical. Chapter 29 on Warren Harding was one of my favorite chapters to write because I love, love, love maps. I think right. every yeah. I think every history book should have at least one map and the best ones often have several. And this is one of those examples where the map tells the story so much better than I ever could through words. That's so interesting. I love maps too. I'm actually a sailor, as most of my listeners know. And so I love nautical charts and maps. And it gives you such insight into where you are and where you're going. And there's so many different paths you can see by looking at a map. It really is a great way to study history. And I'm a big history buff too. So that's one of the reasons I love this book and love having this conversation. So before we get into that conversation, though, I want to get a little bit more background about you so that our listeners can understand who you are and why you're an expert on this topic. So first of all, what exactly is a fractional CMO? Great question. A fractional CMO is kind of a newfangled way to talk about a part-time chief marketing officer, someone who is contract on staff, but not full-time. I work with more than one client where I serve in that role of chief marketing officer for typically smaller companies that need that kind of guidance, but don't have the need or they're not at the point yet where they need a full-time marketing department, but they want to get to that level. And it's my job to help bridge them from where they are today 
to that next point where they're going to bring on an entire marketing team and they're going to grow to that point. But as you and I both know, many organizations, there's a gap there between the startup company, that kind of young company phase, and getting to the scale where it makes sense to bring in full-time marketing people. That's true. And marketing is such a important aspect of any growing company, but a lot of people don't want to put the money into it. They don't want to invest in it and they just forget how important it is to have good marketing. I do think it's really interesting. Okay. So you're a chief marketing officer and your book gives that same title to all of the presidents of the United States throughout history. And I think that's interesting. Why do you think that they are the chief marketers of our country? When you think about the role of the president, and the president has a lot of roles, uh, many of which defined by the U.S. Constitution, of course, mm -hmm. the chief executive, the commander in chief of the armed forces. There are a lot of roles that people are very familiar with. But one of the roles that is less obvious is of the steward of the idea of America itself. It's easy for people not to think about that today. But in 1776, the idea that a government would only derive its power from the consent of the governed was utterly revolutionary. And yes, people will talk about the ancient Greeks and the ancient Greek democracies, and they'll talk about the parliamentary system in Britain. But at the time, remember, Britain still had a king. Now, most European countries are monarchies. Many of them were military dictatorships or tribal dictatorships. This was a completely new idea and a new invention. So the president, as its figurehead, needed to, throughout history, tackle different issues of that idea through its life cycle. For example, when George Washington took office, most people don't know that the most popular form of currency in the new United States was the Spanish peso. Ah, That's what most people that. used. Or most people use their own state's currency. So in order to have trust and faith in the United States government, you needed to have a currency that everyone believed in. Well, it really wasn't all about money. It wasn't about economics. It was about what did people believe so it was all about how did George Washington create the infrastructure and the persona that people would believe in the United States and believe in its money? That was not a foregone conclusion. That was kind of the first act as chief marketing officer was to get people to believe that our currency had value and that you should use it. It really started right there. And every president since then has faced a different sort of challenge in terms of where that idea is in its life cycle. The country has changed. Lots of things have changed about the United States, but communicating to people what that idea is and what it means now and why you should believe in it is a never ending job and a clear role for the president up to today. That's a fascinating perspective. I mentioned in the introduction that you grew up in a family of artists and entrepreneurs and also immigrants. Tell me about that. What kind of artists were they? What kind of entrepreneurs? How, and how did that impact you? It was never a dull moment. I can promise you that. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of foul language. There were a lot of animals in the house. There were art supplies in the house. There were building projects going on all, all the time. I have two branches of the family. My mother's side of the family came from Cuba after the revolution. Mm -hmm. And they landed with kind of nothing but the clothes on their backs at the time. And it, that very first generation immigrant perspective and energy and work and drive mm. to, be, to be successful in the United States because no one was giving you anything, especially in the 1960s. The other side of the family were basically all inventors and entrepreneurs. They all ran their own businesses, auto repair businesses, body shops, salons, my dad was a advertising art director in the Minneapolis area, uh, New York, Chicago, and worked on some of the biggest accounts and some of the biggest ad campaigns for Procter & Gamble and for different food brands. So I grew up with advertising and with people starting new businesses and fun collection projects and all sorts of things and that but teamed up with that drive to make something happen 
that I think is really the great pot of gumbo that is entrepreneurship is one part creativity and energy and smarts and ideas with one part indefactible drive and Mm -hmm. you're going to make it happen no matter what. And I was lucky. I feel very, very fortunate to have the perspective that I do that comes naturally. Other people need to learn that you wake up at five every morning and you don't go to bed until the work's done. That's right. Uh, And it's hard to forget that when, you know, your mom's coming home from her second job and your dad is waking you up and getting you off to school because he's got client calls that morning. That's right. It sounds like it was a great combination of creativity balanced with business sense and this work ethic. And that's an interesting combination because some people who are very artistic and very creative don't have as much of the entrepreneur or business mind and vice versa. That's an interesting combination to sort of have been immersed in both and then combine it with this with this drive to succeed. Sounds like a great way to grow up. <laughs> I think it was, you Good know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I can promise you that. But once I graduated college, it was pretty easy. I wanted to launch products and I wanted to help others do that. Throughout my career, that's basically been it to get, and most people think about marketing in terms of advertising and public relations and the slogans they see. Right. But what most people forget is that marketing is about so much more than that on planning and pricing and logistics and infrastructure to make all of that advertising stuff happens. Imagine if there was a new brand of Cheerios and you were really excited about it. I just saw it on the store shelves. It was uh, <laughs> pumpkin spice Cheerios. Oh my goodness. I, I know. How long, how did it take him this long to come up with that? Exactly. So they're pumpkin spice Cheerios. Well, let's say you saw an advertisement about that. It was really compelling and you you really wanted to go to the store and you wanted to pick up a box. You wanted to try it. Mm-hmm. Yet when you got there, well, the product wasn't consistent. You know, the flavor wasn't very good or it wasn't on the store shelves. You couldn't find it or it was priced funny. It was priced two or three times what the other boxes of Cheerios were. If all of those things don't line up so that you can go get it in the store when you want it, marketing has failed. It doesn't matter what the advertising says. If I can't get it when I want it, you know, my mom and dad used to tell me nothing happens until someone sells something. And you've got to get to that point where you can get to that transaction. If that transaction is not successful, marketing failed. Simple as that. Right. So it starts with a good product, but you can have the best product in the world. And if nobody knows about it, you're not going to sell it. Or if no one can get to it, it can't get to the store. And that's right, really that. Right. That's that's really why when I looked at that part of the problem in marketing, and you know, thinking about it more broadly, how does the United States get its product to market? In World War One, the product of the United States it needed to get to market was war supplies food, materials, all of those things needed to get to the East Coast so they could get on a boat and go over to the front in France. And if they couldn't cross the ocean that way, if you couldn't get supplies efficiently there, it didn't really matter. And in the interim, most people don't realize the United States did not enter World War I until very late in the game. The real issue was at that time, the Germans, the you know, the central powers totally understood that if when the Americans got in the war, they were done, if they could mobilize. Well, right at that time, the Germans launched a major spring offensive and almost beat the Allied powers in that interim. It scared the American war planners to death that they almost lost. Most people don't realize how close we came to losing World War One. Wow, fascinating. Your book is about a lot of things. I want you to talk a little bit about what inspired you to write this book. It's such an interesting perspective to take these different topics and and show how different leaders or a country or our chief marketing officers, our presidents, affected those different times and how they acted as this chief marketing officer. It's really an interesting concept, but I particularly want to talk about the one chapter where we discuss the Pershing map. But first, Tell us about the inspiration for your book. How did this idea come to you to write a book from this kind of perspective? You know, what's funny, Michelle, is that it was never meant to be a book. When I conceived of it originally, I thought, well, you know, who reads books anymore? 
Uh, a lot of people. Uh, oh, I know. I, I, you come to re- you come to realize that later. Right. But I thought, you know what? I want to write, and I created a blog mm-hmm. where I would research and write and learn a story about a particular president. And I did it each week over the course of 44 weeks. I wanted to do it up into the the 2020 election. Mm-hmm. I thought, wow, that's good timing. You know, marketing sure. folks are nothing if not good timers. That's right. So I said it so that my last chapter would get published right at election week. So I thought, oh, that's going to get the greatest interest in the president. That's, you know, the timing seemed sure. right. Yeah. Of course. I was interested in it, but it wasn't really meant to be a book. It was just meant to be a series of blog posts and interviews and interesting things because I'm a kind of a naturally curious person and I write to think and I love to learn things. As I would learn, my challenge was to relate the story of each of these presidents to some aspect of advertising and marketing that people could understand. I really felt like when we went to high school or college, you took a history course, and what's the biggest challenge? It just doesn't seem like it relates to you today. Right. It, it seems separate and different. And, you know, I learned about the War of 1812. Well, that has nothing to do with us today. We're in a different place. Well, my challenge was to make it relatable and interesting the way I find it. I find it relatable and interesting. I, can, I consider it a superpower of mine. When I face a problem, uh, whether that's launching a product or communicating an idea, I don't have just my own experience. I have the experience of everyone I've researched, every situation I've looked at in the past to help me figure out what solutions might be, what has been tried in the past, what might work. Not to say that you repeat that. History doesn't repeat, but history rhymes. The same ideas kind of rhyme again and again. And if you notice those patterns, you can take advantage of them. So basically, I published all of those essays. And I got to the end. And I had an email list as well. There are thousands of people on the email list. And the last one went out. And I said, I really, everyone, I don't know what to do now with this. <laughs> you ran out of presidents. Yeah, I ran out of presidents. <laughs> now, we're done. What now? I said, well, why don't you put it into a book? That would be pretty easy. You know, you could uh, put them all in a kind of a published package and you can send that out. Well, I said, well, gosh, how hard could that be? <laughs> well, as the publisher uh, of 13 books, uh, that's why I laughed. <laughs> yeah, you should laugh. And I can laugh about it now. How hard could that be? How yeah, what could, could possibly be? go wrong, right? Exactly. Famous last words. Long story short, I did make it through that process. I'm very glad I did, not only because I have a book to talk with you about, but also that the process of converting a weekly blog entry into a book chapter required another level of rigor and research and fact checking that simply wasn't there originally. And I'm so much more proud of the end product now that it's gone through that process than I was before. So having a print book, an ebook, and even an audio book and going through the process of recording and editing to give that a completely new experience was really fascinating to me. I agree. It's an interesting process. And I'm glad you made it a book too, because some people just like to read a book, like to the, turn the page or and now right. to read on their Kindle or whatever. And some people want to just read it all at once. So that's nice. I'm glad you did it too. It opens your audience so that more people can read these interesting stories. I want to talk about the Pershing map. So first of all, Who was General Pershing and what was the Pershing map? Well, long story short, uh, General Pershing was uh, one of those people we think today of who are the most famous generals, General Patton, General Eisenhower, folks that are in living memory. General Pershing would be one of the people we would have talked about if we were doing this interview in 1935 for instance, or even 1960. We would have remembered those sort of luminary figures at that at that time who were really heroes of that age in American history. Most people think that the greatest generals were those who were kind of field commanders, and they were the ones who kind of had this brilliant strategic and tactical victories on the battlefield. When you actually talk with military historians, they'll tell you that the most successful generals were the best at logistics. They were more quartermaster than 
field commander. And they understood that what really meant the difference in success or failure, not on a, in, on a one-to-one battle. For instance, General Lee in the Civil War was a master strategist and tactician and could win almost any battle he fought. But General Grant was a better logistician. He was a better quartermaster and understood how to marshal resources and put on the relentless pressure that kept pushing him back. So General Pershing was in the mold of a General Grant. He was the type of person who understood field logistics, how materials move from place to place. In World War I, it could take weeks for something like a a ranch in Wyoming to get the cattle to the processing plants in, let's say, Chicago, and then get that protein to the docks and the ports in New York and Boston and get that over the ocean to France so that you could feed troops on the front lines. Just the mechanics and the logistics of all of that when there were no real roads as we understand them today. This there is the original rail- supply chain. This is the original supply chain. People remember there were railroad maps at that time. That's how people got across the country after after the Oregon Trail and after the wagon trains. Right. One of the very first things the United States did was put in canals and railroads. The problem, of course, is that railroads are expensive, not only to make them and maintain them, but the trains and the cars to put on them are very expensive and not very flexible. They're very good for bulk, long distance, but they're mm-hmm. not really good If I have a two-mile jaunt down the road across a hill to get to a ranch, you're never going to build a railroad spur to go down there. That doesn't make a lot of sense. sense. Exactly. So the whole idea was General Pershing was tasked with going out into the United States and figuring out where were the most important routes to build roads. When you actually look at the Pershing map, it maps almost exactly onto the interstate highway system kind of a generation later. But this was the first one. All of those interstates are largely built on top of the original plan from the Pershing map. When you think about I-5, I-90, you know some of those big trunk highways, I-35 that goes all the way from Texas to northern Minnesota, mm-hmm. all of those were designed originally in the kind of the waning days and the follow-up to World War I and were created interstates later. And the whole point is, it's kind of funny that when you think about, well, what, why were roads such a big deal? Well, uh, two words, Henry Ford. Most people think that Henry Ford, the biggest invention he had was the Model T and the commercialization of the automobile. Well, most people in manufacturing, your listeners here will realize, well, his biggest invention to the manufacturing supply chain was the truck. This amazing combination of horse and railroad. If you think about the truck in that way, hmm. it was it was almost as flexible as a horse. Not quite. It couldn't go anywhere, but it could go anywhere the roads were. Right. And it could carry not as much as a train could, but it could carry a lot. It could carry a lot more than a horse. It was this intermediary vehicle that could get huge volumes of goods from train stations distributed to where they needed to be much, much, much faster. Instead of weeks to get from, you know, really remote areas of the West and the Southwest and the Northeast, you could shave that time from weeks to days or even hours. And that was transformative for the war effort originally, like many innovations come from military, come from the space program, very quickly understood as a a boon to commercialism in the United States. Very, very, very interesting. So the Pershing map was actually this collection of railroad trails or railroad, just railroads getting you from one place to another. And then the roads kind of sprouted from that. Yeah, the railroad map was really the starting point. There were maps of all of the railroads. And if you look at them, they look very complex, they look that, wow, the railroads seem to go everywhere in the United States. Why would you need roads? Well, when you zoom in another layer and you look at where the railroads are really going, they just don't go to all the places they need to go. Just think about your own hometown, wherever that might be, anywhere in 
you know, Mobile, Alabama or Minneapolis, Minnesota, right? the train would come in. And I remember seeing this and it's still there in St. Paul, Minnesota at the Union Depot downtown. The trains come in, you can see all the trains, and then they'll go up towards North Dakota, Montana, all the way to Seattle. Here's the thing. Think about the train tracks and how many train tracks you see just when you're driving about town and then how many roads you see. Mm -hmm. And it becomes obvious really quickly that the trains capture a tiny fraction of where people are and where they need to be. Even though the trains could move you pretty quickly, the roads could get you to little places you know, around town. Now, there was no kind of getting from one suburb to another in 1915. That just didn't exist. You pretty much stayed pretty close to where you were going, or you went to a completely other city. You just didn't have that same kind of flexibility in travel that you do. And that opened up opportunities for commerce and opportunities for distribution and manufacturing that just never existed before. It's such fascinating history, and I could talk to you about it all day long because I, I love history and maps too. But how do we connect this Pershing map and this idea of this kind of the original supply chain? How does that connect to manufacturing today? When I think about if we just use the same analogy, if we thought, okay, at first there were railroads. Railroads could take us anywhere the major cities and spurs were. Big cities, big connection points, big chunks of manufacturing material and supplies to other big centers where they could be moved. So everything needed to be around the trains and needed to be concentrated there. What the Pershing map and then later the interstate highway system did was gave it that extra layer of flexibility. Now, you could get wherever the roads would take you. And we tend to think of the roads kind of taking, well, gosh, the road could take you anywhere you needed to go. But anyone who's been stuck in traffic understands the limitations of roads and kind of that two-dimensional space. What I think about is there are a lot of answers to this question, really, Michelle. But one of the obvious ones is the experimentation right now. Amazon and other companies are using drones and taking the map to a third dimension. Mm -hmm. And what are the airways, not the commercial airways, you know, that are at 30,000 feet, but what is that distance between zero and 100 feet? What does that map look like? How do we map those kind of interconnections? I was in Houston a few weeks ago and getting from Tomball, Texas to Galveston, what you realize quickly is you can go right through Houston or you can tell, take the Beltway, the toll road around Houston, and it's just kind of a six of one, half dozen of the other in terms of distance and traffic. The roads are limited by geographic features. They're limited by congestion, all manner of things. But when you think about it, what if I needed to get something from Tomball to Galveston faster than that? Could I use a drone? And could it go as the crow flies? You know, the shortest distance between two points is a line, a straight line. How could it do something like that? How could we start to think about a map of low altitude transportation? Because drones are being able to carry more and more cargo. You know, they're not like the ones you get at Best Buy anymore. That's right. Uh, yeah. Some of these drones can carry up to a few hundred pounds. Hmm. How do we think about a new type of map for point-to-point -point communication and point-to-point -point transportation of goods, services, and people? It sounds really far-fetched. It seems like Jetsons and where's my flying car? <laughs> totally right. understand. But we think about that kind of thing. That was the same thing people were thinking in 1915, 1917, around the advent of the Model T. But right in the background, in the more important transition was the truck. I think at this point, one of the things we should be looking for is what is the drone truck that's not on the interstate highway, but it's in low altitude flight with a fraction of the weight, but for giving manufacturers another way to get critical cargo from point A to point B in a fraction of the time. Think about every major retailer right now, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, you name them. They all want to get you products and services within an hour or two. 
Well, what if you're in a high traffic area? There's no way that new pumpkin spice box of Cheerios is coming to your house <laughs> anywhere, anytime under an hour during rush hour. Right. But put it on a drone, it could be there in 10 minutes. That's absolutely it's- right and fascinating. And you know, drones these days, but people don't realize most consumers look at drones and they, they see the drones that we use to make videos or a lot of realtors use them to get shots of the home from overhead. But the drone can be as small as my hand and they could be the size of a pizza or they could be the size of a picnic table. Some of the drones are gigantic. When you think about just the drone that carries the camera for personal use that many people own, Then you think of the drone that carries the big, huge camera that movie makers use, for example. If they can carry that big, huge camera in the air to make these aerial shots that we see on movies that are so cool and take you through the city and you see the top of the buildings and all that. If they can do that, they could certainly take a box of cereal and drop it off on your porch. It's It's closer than we think. I couldn't agree more. Much closer. And if you even think there's another scale heavier than that. And anyone with a military background has seen them. The Predator, the Reaper drones that the military uses to fly into dangerous areas and even areas where they don't want to put human pilots. Anyone who's seen a Predator or a Reaper knows how big they really are. They're surprisingly big. If you can get to that size aircraft that can fly at those speeds and those altitudes with that kind of cargo especially heavy munitions and explosive cargo, well, it's not a big leap to think that there could be a commercial version of the Predator that carried perhaps up to 500 to 1,000 pounds right, of cargo exactly. from point A to point B. It is it is not science fiction. And I think from a logistics, transportation, marketing, manufacturing perspective, being able to think about point-to-point communication that isn't dependent on roads, but is dependent on low-altitude flight and low-altitude distribution network, a new map that looks at how could we take advantage. And there's no problem with rivers, no problem with treetops, none of those kind of major landform features. You need to get to a level of the Rocky Mountains uh, to be able to really put something in the way of an aircraft like that. But for most intra-city transportation, it's simply not an issue. Uh, You could get around pretty easily and quickly. Again, it seems like science fiction, but it really isn't. I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years, we weren't starting to see the first regulations, the first kind of government maps. What are those flight paths? inside cities and how do we prevent aircraft from crashing into people's backyard parties? There are going to need to be some rules about that. But uh, one of the chapters after 29, we get to the chapter on Herbert Hoover, who was one of the people who coordinated the very first rules for traffic in the United States. Before you had those rules, there were no safety standards for cars. There was no rules for cars. Imagine being downtown Manhattan with no traffic rules. Wow. Yeah. Just crazy. And we, <laughs> we don't think about it now, but right. it was absolutely deadly to be on the road at a level we, that's not even close to what it is now. We are, we're so much safer today than we were. We can imagine a scenario between now and a decade from now where 3,000 pound drones are crashing into things because we don't have the kind of rules and infrastructure that's needed to make sure that that doesn't happen. When we think about what did the manufacturing organizations and the trade associations really do? Well, I can tell you that the automobile trade associations essentially helped write the rules in the 1920s for cars. They took an active role in it because they had an interest in it. I think manufacturers have an interest today in making sure they write the rules for this next generation of point-to-point transportation, whether that's drones, whether that's hyperloops, other ultra-fast railways. I think it's dangerous to sit on the sidelines and let others do that. Better to be in the driver's seat, or at the very least, better to have a seat at the table. Right. You know, it's all an evolution. 
if you think back to those days when the railroad system was built and that's how people were able to distribute their products and and that was the original supply chain and then the roads were developed as you said so at the time the railroads were developed they weren't thinking about roads and then once the roads were developed they started thinking about other things like air travel and other things and now we're talking about drones as we were talking about this it made me think Back to the 1980s, the movie Back to the Future, where the guy says, where we're going, there are no roads. There, there's something to that. I don't think we're headed toward a place where there are no roads. But I think it's part of the evolution to be thinking beyond that system now. I, I like this idea of talking about transporting goods by drone or whatever. But in the end, we're talking about distribution. We're talking about supply chain. And I think I think we really need to touch on a really important topic. And that is what we just all went through and what we're still going through, which is this pandemic. And I think it taught us a lot about how important supply chain is, especially in the space of manufacturing. So how do you think that the pandemic has affected the way we look and think about the supply chain? When I think about the supply chain, it's no easier really than just walking into my local Target store. And I don't mean to pick on Target here. The Walmart has the same issue. Best Buy has the same issue. Pretty much every manufacturer that is in the listening audience here has faced some sort of this issue. And that's frankly, empty shelves. Well, what is the root cause of an empty shelf? Well, there could be many possible root causes. There could be a transportation issue. There could be the good can't get from where it is to where it needs to be. There could be a driver shortage where there just aren't drivers to get to operate the trains, operate the railroads, operate the aircraft, operate the trucks. It could be any number of different components in that supply chain I'm sure your your audience will recognize the need for supply chain management, have systems in place for that. But in many cases, there's simply no way to get around single source for critical components, critical ingredients, where you just can't substitute A for B, whether that's a regulatory concern or whether that's a, we don't ha- we haven't invented a second source for that yet. So when I think about the connection between supply chain and distribution, I think about how can the physical distribution system assist in making second sourcing, third sourcing, kind of backup sourcing, not only more available, but more cost effective. Because kind of marketing 101, sales 101, if you you have a supply chain problem where you can't, you've got, what does Ford have hundreds of trucks in the desert without computer chips in them? If you can't get your product to market and it can't be available for sale, you're not going to sell any. It seems so basic, but I think about manufacturers really having the opportunity to rethink supply chain and actually having conversations with their marketing folks. Here is the bill of materials for this particular good that we produce. And here's the what the supply chain looks like. Here's the problem. We may not be able to get component X, Y, and Z. How could we turn that into an advantage? Could we create a new product or a new version of the product that eliminated that critical component and use something else? And could we market that product instead or as a substitute or a fill-in or a side along This is where I think having the operations, the manufacturing folks, and the marketing folks together so that they can think through those supply chain challenges in a way to create new opportunities. Because the bottom line is, if Target's got an empty shelf and you're Clorox and you can't put Clorox wipes on the shelf, someone else is going to come up with a way to soak tissues in alcohol and put them on Target shelf. (laughs) Exactly. In the opening, we talked about, okay, what does the Pershing map of the future of manufacturing look like? And as you and I both know, as lovers of maps, we know that maps tell us where we're going, tell us where we've been, give us new routes, give us new ways of getting to different places, all those things. But it's also a metaphor for a way of thinking. What we're talking about is not just a literal roadmap for the future of manufacturing, but what do you think is the direction of the future? We already talked a little bit about drones, but let's dive in deeper. I think one of the simplest things I think manufacturers can do immediately, if they think, well, drones would be great, but gosh, that that's far out. I'll wait for 
X, Y, and Z bigger company to figure out drones and then I'll use them. Fair. Right. Totally sure. fair. What can you do today? One of the things you can do today is get out a map. And if it's a simple supply chain, it's a map of the United States, Canada, Mexico, perhaps. If you have a more complex supply chain, it's a global map. Mark on that map where you are and where everything that needs to come to you will come from. And color code them much in the same way the Pershing map had a priority one, priority two, and priority three on the map. Mm -hmm. You can color code on that map red, yellow, and green. Like, hey, where in the map are the red lines? Not just like, hey, there's a dot in Shenzhen and a dot in Denver, for instance. It's like, no, where does that go in Shenzhen? Well, it kind of comes from a factory in Shenzhen somewhere. It's got to hit the port, maybe in Shenzhen or Hong Kong. And then it's going to go by container ship. Where does that container ship land? Probably Los Angeles, somewhere in that area. Okay, great. What happens then in the port of Los Angeles in customs and then the route that it's going to take, whether that's by rail, by air, by road, to get to you in Denver so that you can use it. And you can start to map how long is that typically going to take? Where is that problem? Now, a lot of software will do this for you and that kind of really intricate supply chain management and it'll have all the Gantt charts in it. I have found, though, that just simply having a map and something visual that you can look at is so much more powerful than that. You can see really quickly, we've got all kinds of red lines converging on the port of Los Angeles. That could be a problem if there's a backup of containers there, or if there's some sort of a problem where the pandemic is putting a whole bunch of dock workers out of commission and container ships are backed out to sea 10 to 15 miles. What happens then? And what are your alternatives? And when you see a red line, how do you make a red line into a yellow line? Well, you have another line. And mm, where yeah. might that go? That's how maps can be so powerful in a way that kind of looking at a spreadsheet just isn't. And I would recommend make a map today of your critical supply chain. And you might be surprised, enlightened, or frankly, terrified by what you see. <laughs> I think that's fantastic advice because you, you don't know how to get to where you're going until you know where you are. That's <laughs> you right. You have that's to first know where one. you are and then you can figure, and then to know where you're going, then you figure out how to get there. And there's more than one way. And I think that's what we're talking about here. There's more than one way to get that cereal on the shelf and in front of people. I know, Jason, that your expertise is mostly in product development. And that, of course, is a huge part of manufacturing, as we know, because as we said before, if people don't know about your product, you're not going to sell it. From your perspective, though, let's talk about the factory of the future. What does it look like to you? The factory of the future, for me, when you think about what does manufacturing look like 10 years from now, many manufacturers are just beginning the subtractive to additive revolution. What that means for probably the few in the audience who, who have not experienced that is subtractive processes are you bring in a big hunk of wood, like a tree, and you make it into pencils or you right. make it into wooden spoons or whatever the case may be. It is subtractive. It takes most of the wood and converts it to sawdust and other things. And if you're efficient with that process, you can make that sawdust into, you can add some resin to it and make furniture. There are other things you can do. But ultimately, there's waste in that process because you are removing from a raw material. When you think about an additive process, additive processes are those where you bring in kind of raw ingredients and you print the items that you need. Now, 10 years ago, when I started in product development or you know, 20 years ago, the machines usually made by a company called Stratasys. And People may have heard of them, but there were others. Those things cost a quarter million dollars and they printed crap. They were really only good for prototypes. And so you could see a physical mock-up of your product before you actually went to make a mold and you did your plastics and all that other stuff. Right. Today, however, during my career, 10 years later, you could buy that same machine for $25,000 and they could print darn near perfect in certain categories. 
Today, you can buy a similar quality machine for about $2,500. You can even buy hobby machines at Best Buy for $250. The point is that as that technology improves, we can use additive manufacturing to help create a wider variety of parts and respond to market conditions faster. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say that we were making those wooden spoons or composite spoons, whatever the case may be, and you had a subtractive process in your supply chain, in your manufacturing. You'd bring in the logs, you'd create your spoons, you'd add some resin so they wouldn't fall apart or break, and you would hope that people would want to buy those because you knew you had a supply chain and you had to get wood to the factory, do the manufacturing, kind of burn them down and get them out to the field. Well, what if that factory could be smaller and located more closely to the retailer's distribution channel? And right as the consumer demanded a product, you'd have the raw ingredients on site and you would print the spoon that you needed. So in my mind, the factory of the future is a lot of smaller factories using more additive processes distributed closer to where the retailers and their distribution system is. Because people, you and I, and all of our kids and our parents, they are becoming less patient with every passing day Mm -hmm. in terms of how long they're going to wait for Amazon to get them their thing. That's just life. And speed is life. The factory, the future is going to need to figure out ways to get manufacturing to happen faster by putting it closer to where the customer is rather than sending it away. You could even see a scenario in which you could license the software from your favorite manufacturer and print certain parts of your products at home. Why not? Wow. That is something to think about. That's interesting. Good. That that was a great answer. We're coming to the end of our time. I could talk to you all day long. I'm really enjoying this conversation. And I, I do want to thank you for being here today and for sharing all your knowledge and expertise. But I do want to give you the last word. I want to just give you a chance to talk about anything else that you want to say about the future of manufacturing from your perspective. And also be sure and tell the listeners how they can get your book. Well, first off, thank you. For us marketing folks and innovation folks and product development folks, it's not all that common that we get an audience with manufacturing executives and innovators in that space. And I think we need to be speaking more regularly and coming up with solutions to problems more collaboratively more often. It's such an opportunity to have that cross-pollination. I can tell you over the course of my career, how many times operations and manufacturing and supply chain executives have changed the way I've thought about things Mm -hmm. and have made me a better innovator by understanding materials, by understanding supply chains, by understanding total quality management. I wouldn't be where I was without them. So I consider this a a tiny return of that favor uh, of all the insight I've gathered over the years. So I think if there's any takeaway that I could give to the manufacturing executives in the audience, it would be sit down with your product developers, product managers, marketing folks, go out to lunch, go have a beer and just get to know them because the collaboration will be worth it. It will absolutely be worth it. And last word though, and I appreciate you giving me the last word. That's very kind of you. Of course. Uh, You you can buy Marketer in Chief, how each president sold the American idea, basically wherever you buy books, just hit Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever the case may be. You can pick up a print book, an ebook or an audio book. And I promise you in that book that you will, it will be the least boring history book you have ever read. (laughs) I can attest to that. I've read several chapters. It is really interesting. I really think this audience audience will love it. I think you will. I think many people might not pick it up. It's, "Ah, I just, you know, there's only so much. It's political campaigns and politics. You'd be surprised how little politics is really in the book. It just doesn't factor that much because politics is kind of a backdrop to kind of everything. It's just the, it's just power brokering. What's really interesting are the things you don't see behind the scenes. And that's what I wanted to focus on in this book. 
you'll like it. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or you don't care either way from Sunday. It won't matter. You'll like this. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. If you love history and it's just such an interesting perspective to think about the president of the United States being the chief salesman for our country. And it it really does change the perspective. And I, I just love it. I love the idea and the concept. And I, I really do think people will like it. So Jason, thank you again so much for being here. It's been super fun. And hopefully you'll come back and we'll talk some more. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. This brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. If you have interesting information to share and want to contact me about being a guest on a future episode of this podcast, please send me an email at michelle at navigatecontent.com. You can also send me questions that I will have my expert guests answer for you on a future episode. And in the meantime, please check out my book series on modern manufacturing to read more than 30 real world case studies about how global companies are using smart technology and innovation to build the factory of the future. All the links to the books and articles mentioned in this podcast are in the show notes. Have a great week and please join me for the next episode of Factory of the Future.